Hello and welcome back. This is the last part of a three-part mini-series explaining SEMG, what it is, what it's actually telling you, and how to use it in clinic. Again, my name is Gabby. I'm a CPO with True Angle Medical Technologies and an adjunct assistant professor in the Communication Sciences and Disorders Department at the University of Alberta in Canada. In this video, I will talk about what you can and can't do with SEMG in clinic. Let's start off with one thing that I learned much too late into using SEMG in clinic, and that is that signal amplitude should not be compared between sessions or people. So many, many years ago, I remember sitting down with patients, I had them hooked up to the K-Pentax, and I diligently marked down their amplitude trial after trial. And after their treatment, I would make a, a report graphing their amplitude changes. So let's say if I had a patient come in for that first session, session number one, and I would sit down and go, okay, your swallowing muscles are contracting at about 60 microvolts, that's great. And the next day they'd come in and I'd go, hmm, that's odd, you're not doing so well today. You must be having an off day. And then they'd come back again and this time they'd have amazing peaks and I'd go, woohoo, therapy's working, look at you. And it wasn't until later I came across an article by Dr. Katrina Steele followed by many others during my PhD that explained how that was probably not a good use of my time. Amplitude should not be compared between sessions or between people. So if you knew this already, that's great. If you didn't and were too embarrassed to ask or you didn't know you didn't know, hopefully this little bit helped. So what do you do instead? Well, you normalize the signal. What does that mean? Well, you take some variables out of the equation. So let's say you have a given patient on a given day sitting in a given room with a given placement of the electrodes on their chin. Um, just have them complete maybe three to five regular swallows. So let's say um, that I have these four regular swallows. I call them calibration swallows. And I take the average amplitude of these swallows. For argument's sake, to make it easier, let's say that average comes to 100 microvolts. Now a normalized amplitude is whatever your patient's doing during the exercise part of the session divided by the calibration average amplitude, so that 100. So let's say during the exercise you have them do just a normal regular swallow um, like they normally would is what I meant. So that comes to 90 microvolts, and you divide that by 100 microvolts, your calibration average amplitude, and you get 0 0.90. That is your normalized amplitude. Now some of you may be familiar with this sort of math um, when we normalize based on maximum effort. So when we ask a patient to push with the tongue as hard as they can when using the IOP, for instance, um, and the clinical targets are set as a percentage of that maximum effort. It's the same sort of idea here too. It's just that we're using regular swallows instead of maximum effort. So what do you do with that? Well, if you're in session with a patient, you can now use percentages of that normalized amplitude to set your targets, your clinical targets. So let's say you're training an effort to full swallow. You tell your patient to swallow as hard as they can, push hard with the tongue against the roof of their mouth. And maybe they reach 200% of that normalized amplitude. They're rock stars. Um, or maybe they reach only 100% of that normal, normalized amplitude and you try to elicit more effort from them. That percent of normalized amplitude is now a number that you can compare between sessions. Okay, so this is quite a bit of work, obviously, why bother? Um, well, there are a lot of advantages of using SEMG biofeedback when working with patients with dysphagia. So for one, um, just think how rewarding it is for you when you go to the gym and all of a sudden you notice that the five pound bell is too late for you and you can move on to the 10 pound bell. Well, we can't do that in therapy. But using biofeedback, SEMG biofeedback, we can show patients incremental improvement. So obviously EMG allows us to monitor the activation of those submental muscles during exercises. Um, EMG signal is associated with the kinematics of a swallow. 
However, there's a caveat here. Kinematic performance cannot be confirmed with EMG signal alone, so just keep that in mind. And EMG signal is sensitive to the type of swallowing task performed, so it makes it a useful adjunct um, to training different exercises for us. Other strengths, it's non-invasive, it's easy to apply, um, requires minimal training really. Um, monitor, it allows us to monitor mus muscle activity, like I said. It brings into awareness for the patient muscle control, and SEMG has been used um, to help uh, relax muscles in other fields. It's a good visual adjuvant to treatment, um, but like I said, we can't compare intercession or interperson without the normalization of the amplitude, and we can't look at a specific muscle. I mean, there are ways to do that, but you and I in clinic um, can't do that, as far as I know. Um, the other thing that I love about EMG biofeedback is that it recognizes and rewards small changes that will eventually lead to meaningful functional improvements. So it increases self-efficacy in patients by, by drawing their attention to these small um, signs of progress. And that's not just in our field, but when using SEMG with any um, type of muscle training. And this is super important um, to me anyway when considering adherence, um, that little outcome that everyone's talking about. Now one thing that I would like to caution clinicians when going out there and reading literature on SEMG is that different research groups may use different placements based on whatever research question they're trying to answer. So there is no right or wrong, but whenever you go to the clinic and trying to and try to achieve the same outcomes or um, look at the same sort of measures as someone else, just make sure that you're comparing apples to apples, that you're putting the EMG electrodes in the same place as the research group that you are trying to emulate. All right, so why is placement so important? Let's revisit this. Um, we touched on it in the last two um, tutorials. So there's a ground electrode, like we said, and two active electrodes. Now the ground electrode should be placed on a bony prominence and not on muscle. And the active electrodes should be on muscle, parallel with, in this case, um, I've been talking about the anterior belly of the digastric. And why is that? Well, because the signal collected by the ground electrode is subtracted from that of the active electrodes. So what that means is that um, if you're sitting next to a microwave, for instance, um, versus sitting in a beautiful, quiet garden, um, that ground electrode will ensure that what the active electrodes are capturing is more or less what the muscles of interest are doing. And because you want to be able to track progress by being standardized in your sessions. Okay, so getting ready for your first appointment. Um, I like to prepare two gauze pads or alcohol pads to clean under the chin uh, and prepare the skin. Uh, two SEMG adhesive pads, just in case one doesn't work, I like to have one handy. The wires, if you're using a wired system. The electrode gel, if uh, it's the types of electrodes that need it. SEMG signal acquisition box, if you're working with K-Pentax, that'll be the Swallowing Signals Lab, I believe it's called. Your monitor, your screen, where you're going to watch everything. Gloves, obviously, and nowadays a mask. Um, water, pudding, anything that you plan on um, giving the patient. Obviously, pen and paper. What do I document? When I document, I think, um, I try to think think of the same principles that I apply in research. And so what that means is I write down any information that I think is needed to share with someone who wants to take over after me or to replicate what I did. So let's say you're sick one day and you can't come in uh, and your colleague needs to see your patient. What information does he or she need to see your patient? So I, pr I write down the placement of the SEMG adhesive or electrodes um, the target that was last achieved consistently, um, any cueing, any comments or observations, and any future steps or goals you think are appropriate. 
And finally, to close off this uh, last bit of the tutorial, I want to touch on how to improve the signal and how to um, achieve some troubleshooting um, things. So to achieve the best skin, uh, signal, pardon me, again, prepare the skin by just washing it gently or using an alcohol pad. Um, use electrogel and electrodes. The thing here is that you don't want too much electrogel, you just want a little dab. If you put too much electrogel, what can happen is the um, electrogel from the three electrodes that you have on there can uh, come together. And what that means, so when you push the adhesive on someone's chin, um, those, uh, that gel squishes and then comes together. And now, essentially, you just have one electrode because these, these gel parts connect together. Um, and then careful placement so that you have, like I said, one electrode on a bony prominence and the other two on the active um, muscle. If you wanted to, for whatever reason, use SEMG on different muscles, just know that the same principle applies. It's just that the setup may look a little different based on what type of electrodes you have. Um, also, the size of the electrodes and the distance between the electrodes matters depending on how big the muscle that you're looking at is. Um, there are guidelines out there. And if you really wanted to dig deep into this kind of stuff, I recommend a tutorial written by Dr. Kara Stepp in 2012 on how to apply a CMG for speech and swallowing systems. Some troubleshooting. If the signal is not responsive, what I do is I just make sure that all the connections are happening. So between the alligator clips and the electrodes, between the electrodes and the skin, um, Sometimes I unplug the wires from the system, plug them back in, that always works. Um, or if nothing else works, then I just try a new um, adhesive with electrodes on it. If you have a really noisy signal, uh, most often it'll be from wire movements. So I like to clip those out of the way so the patient doesn't touch them when he or she is talking to you or trying really hard to swallow or bearing down. Um, it might just be electrical noise in the room, so if you have big equipment, you might want to move to um, a quiet, not a quieter room, but uh, uh, a more office-like room. And that's it. Um, I hope that this has been useful to some of you. Um, please leave any comments or share any tips you might have. And if you have suggestions for future comment for future content that you'd like to see, um, don't hesitate to uh, drop me a line. Thank you so much.